So I think probably most of people here were at today's session, is that right, on MG? So there's probably not a lot of point in, in repeating much of this. Um, so I think everyone knows we don't really have many drugs targets. Azithromycin's been used for at least a couple of decades in our field, not just for MG, but also for chlamydia and uh, gonorrhea and our main syndromes. And this has really resulted in fairly considerable selection pressure. So we've seen this marked uh, declining cure. Yeah, marked declining cure over the last decade. Um, and this has been due to the emergence of resistance to azithro azithromycin. And we know that these SNPs in the 23S ribosomal RNA gene really uh, arise in about 12% of cases following one gram. People will have seen this slide also today that really just highlights the magnitude of the problem. More than 50% macrolide resistance in European, many European countries, North America, and in our part of the world. And then we're left with the other issue of dual class resistance where we're really facing sort of close to 10% in our region and North America, but the things are a lot better in, uh, in Europe. I'm not really gonna talk much about gonorrhea because this is not my area, but uh, people have, everyone will have seen various versions of this slide. And really it just highlights the fact that Gonorrhea has managed to develop resistance to every single drug that's been thrown at it within 10 years of exposure. Um, and really our first line treatment now, keftriaxone, is our last currently available option, excluding those drugs that are in the pipeline. So we're seeing increasing antimicrobial resistance for both of these organisms, and they really are threatening to become untreatable. And while there's a lot more alarm about gonorrhea, um, the reality is MGen is a little bit further down the track in terms of posing really major challenges for us on a daily basis. Now, diagnostics that provide resistance markers are really going to play an increasingly important role in clinical care. So if we look at mycoplasma genitalia and we have our traditional approach here at the top where people have a detect only assay and people are treated with a gram of azithromycin. And we know at the moment, if we use that approach, less than 50% of MG infections will be cured. If we use a macrolide resistance assay, it's obviously a little bit of a no brainer. It helps you individualize care around the macrolide resistance profile, obviously not the quinolone resistance profile yet. So people have seen this uh, repeatedly. Um, I won't go through it in detail, but um, our resistance guided approach involved trying to reduce our use of azithromycin and switching to doxy using a resistance assay and then sequencing directly after doxy either a high dose of azithromycin um, for macrolide susceptible infections or cytofloxacin or moxifloxacin for macrolide resistant infections. So you've seen this slide again today just showing 95% cure when we use doxy 2.5 azithro, 92 when we use doxy sitter. Um, great reduction in de novo resistance down to 2.6%. Pretty good cure in the context of about 20% PARC mutations. Chloe showed you this data today, um, doing exactly the same thing, but uh, employing moxifloxacin, achieving an absolutely identical cure rate with doxy 2.5 azithro of 95% and a surprisingly identical cure rate using doxymoxifloxacin. Now I might just actually say here, because I didn't get a chance to mention it in the talk, while the cure rates are actually identical, it doesn't actually mean that the drugs have equal efficacy. The overall prevalence of PARC mutations in both of those data sets was about 20% but there were some subtle differences in the nature of the PARC mutations that we're really looking at at the moment. So cytofloxacin is in fact superior in vitro and probably superior clinically. Doxycycline is certainly having a very major effect um, within this pathway and is reducing the impact of these PARC mutations. But I don't genuinely think moxifloxacin is as good as CIDA in this pathway, 
but it looks pretty good and it's more available than cetafloxacin and it's certainly very reasonable to go down this path. It's given us a good evidence base finally for this new strategy of a high dose azithromycin. Um, the pooled estimate of de novo resistance is probably less than 3.8% because we you just saw the data just then. That detection component of the assay is a little bit less sensitive. Um, and when we sequenced uh, samples in the first data set, um, we did identify some cases that had been allocated as wild type that had resistance. So that enabled us to actually show that there was less selection of resistance in the first data set. In the set of second data set, unfortunately, our sequencing failed. So the worst case scenario using this strategy is it's about 3.8%, but I genuinely think actually it's closer to 2%. Regardless, it's a lot better than just sticking with one gram and gives us confidence about MOXIE at the moment. Now, this slide is interesting because it looks at the evolution of testing for mycoplasma genitalium in Australia. And I'd like um, just to really highlight, in 2003, many people here will know Sapir Tabrizi, and he was an amazing uh, molecular microbiologist who worked at the women's, and most people working in the STI field have collaborated with him. And he adapted the Yoshida assay that was published in 2002 um, and set up that assay, and I was doing my PhD at the time, and within 12 months we had it routinely in clinic for our key syndromes. And many other services rapidly developed, adopted these in-house assays. Um, they weren't always the Yoshida assay. Jorgen Jensen had an assay that had an MGPA target. Um, this assay, I think, had a 16S ribosome, a, six, a 16S target, didn't it? And Jorgen was always very critical about that assay. He didn't like it at all. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, we used that assay for quite a while, and. Um, Sapir was very, very keen to develop a, re a resistance assay for MG. It was very obvious to him from the beginning, this is what we needed to be doing. Um, and he developed a high resolution melt uh, assay, um, but then approached SpeedX a few years down the track to really set up the MG resistance assay. So this was a really important collaboration and is in part what we have continued on um, with SpeedX, it was really Sapir's legacy. Um, so within uh, a couple of years, we were doing clinical studies and they were independent studies. We sat down and invented our clinical pathways, but we were able to use the assay prior to regulatory approval. Um, the assay got, uh, had regulatory approval in 2016 in Australia, the UK and the EU. Um, and we presented the data in Rio in July and resistance testing um, was rapidly recommended in Europe. Jorgen had already started recommending it, but the Australian guidelines and the UK guidelines followed suit. This year, France and the US are debating it at the moment. So you can see that we were moving inexorably down this sort of slide to really poor first line cure and then really being able to repackage existing drugs and accessing a resistance assay enabled us to really overnight double our cure. But the big game changer really is point of care or near patient resistance guided therapy. So as you've heard, this is a partnership now between Cepheid and SpeedX, where they're adapting their SpeedX resistance assay um, to the Cepheid um, cartridge format. So I'm not a laboratory person, although obviously this doesn't, that's the whole beauty of it, it isn't done in, uh, in doesn't need to be done in a lab. But really the actual uh, sample preparation and reaction mix and internal controls take less than 10 minutes and the cartridge is put on the um, machine and really an hour and a half to two hours um, a result is available. So these are some data that have been um, provided to me by Madeline but just show that um, for the detection component for MG compared to a PCR um, at John Hopkins that it's 100% sensitive, a little bit less specific. 
The big difficulty, and we've just seen this before, is the mutants. And detection is always a little bit less sensitive um, than Sanger sequencing. Um, and so we can see here that it's specific, but it's down to about 92% sensitivity. So we're just, uh, a number of laboratories here have been involved in uh, validating this point of care um, assay. We're doing a large prospective study of about 1,200 patients looking at urine, rectal and cervical vaginal swabs, um, and that's near completion. And hopefully these data will help contribute to TGA approval, which I gather is expected in sort of early 2020. Um, and this is um, a slide from Lisa and Beck, um, looking at the near to patient testing model and really just highlighting the process that we all know we routinely go through when a patient comes to clinic and you rely on a laboratory assay and the sample has to get sent away and then the patient has to get recalled and by the time you get hold of them and they come back into clinic, it can be anywhere really from seven to 21 days compared to this process where in theory you could have a patient um, effectively treated really within about three hours and ideally a, pa a patient's partner notified as well. So the last part on this slide really is the, um, is the fact that I gather that this uh, resistance plus flexible for gene expert is just in September, is that right? Just in the last couple of weeks gone through regulatory approval in the UK and Europe. And as I said, I gather we're on track hopefully for Australia in uh, early next year. Now, people are very familiar with David Wiley's work and his Cipro susceptibility assay and the Grand 2 study that's rolling out in lots of uh, sites across Australia. Um, and the fact that really currently all of our patients with gonorrhea need to be injected with keftriaxone. But if you have a ciprofloxacin and susceptibility assay, potentially up to 70% of patients at the moment um, in urban settings should be able to take an oral tablet. Now, the benefits of point of care or near patient uh, resisted guided therapy are pretty self-evident. Obviously, it enables you to individualise therapy on the day the patient attends. Helps you reduce loss to follow-up, so you have fewer untreated cases. Um, and it will redu reduce the risk of ongoing transmission in the window between testing and return for treatment. Overall, it should reduce number of patient clinic visits. It may reduce the number of treatment regimens. It may not if we retain doxycycline, you know, uh, which I think really the evidence is that we should. Um, it may not alter the number of treatment regimens at all, um, but it will certainly improve partner treatment, may achieve same day partner treatment, overall can improve antimicrobial stewardship, enables us to really dispense with the broad concept of syndromic management. And you would expect, although we don't know, um, that it may reduce overall health costs. It really depends on the cost of integrating these point of care tests in, in clinical services that are uh, functioning potentially quite well with uh, laboratory assays um, and good patient follow-up. So it'll be really very much an, an individual service uh, situation. So I'd like to thank everyone listed on the slide. I think my disclosure is gone, sorry. So we have obviously received research support from Speedex and also from Hologic. Thank you.